Hi, this is Mallory Nye, and welcome to episode 13 of the Religion Bites podcast series. This episode is going to be on the theme of intersectionality and the study of religion. You may recall the metaphor I used back in episode 6 of this podcast series, when I described the use of the warning Mind the Gap on the London Underground. This was in reference to the gap that sometimes occurs between the train carriage and the platform, which has to be crossed carefully to either exit or enter the train. This was my starting point for the discussion of finding the gap between culture and religion. As I then went on to argue in episode 7, I recalled the scene in the first Matrix film, when the enlightened boy instructs the protagonist Neo that in order to bend a spoon, he must first realise that there is no spoon. This, for me, is the issue of culture and religion. That is, there is no gap between the two. Culture and religion are interconnected in all respects. Religion can be understood within culture and vice versa. Culture can be understood within religion. I now want to add a new metaphor to this discussion that leads us into an approach that combines many of the aspects of the last few episodes. Imagine if you can... You are travelling along a road, perhaps a long and difficult journey, in an old car that is difficult to drive and is likely to break down on you at any moment, and the road itself is worn out with plenty of bumps and potholes. At a point on this journey, you reach a crossroads, a meeting point between your particular road and several other roads, some of which are good quality highways, and others are difficult and bumpy roads like your own. The problem is that when you reach this crossroads, this highway intersection, there isn't any traffic control system. There's no signs, no lights, no instructions for giving way, not even any lines on the road to indicate how to approach and go through the intersection. All you can do is proceed with care and try not to bump into the cars coming and going in different directions, towards you and from your left and your right and also from behind you. In such an intersection, your difficult journey along one particular line brings you into potential collisions with others, also following their particular route. You have to interact with each of the other drivers to give and take way, or otherwise when you crash into them, or they crash into you. This is a starting point for understanding how to put together the various aspects of culture, in particular the issues of gender, sexuality, race and ethnicity that I've outlined in the previous two episodes. To put it simply, your own straight journey may be along what concerns you most, for example the road of gender, attempting to navigate oneself through the world in terms of being a female or a male. But on this intersection you find there are others, in many ways similar to you, that are navigating a different journey, in terms of race, of blackness or whiteness, or some other categorization. In particular, what happens when the two of these interact, when a passenger in the gender car pulls the wheel from your hand to bring you alongside a race car? How can the two of these be navigated together? In truth, the metaphor that I've used is not completely accurate. In reality, we are constantly having to make our way through the intersections, there are rarely the long straight roads in between. That is, life and culture are made up of the interactions caused by the intersections. These may be race, gender, sexuality, class, ethnicity, age, ability, religion, and much more as well. This is what we are looking at. This is what the approach known as intersectionality is trying to make some sense out of. This term, intersectionality, was coined by the writer Kimberley Crenshaw in a paper published nearly 20 years ago, in 1989, titled Demarginalising the Intersection of Race and Sex. In this paper she started with what could be considered the basic problem of taking a single axis of power relations, and in particular discrimination and disadvantage, as a means to understand and possibly redress the issues. As she herself noted, The recognition of this problem was not in any way new, but the term she coined to address this, that is, intersectionality, 
has become a key buzzword for much cultural and feminist study as a result of Crenshaw's discussion. The problem is with taking a single axis, that is, a single point of analysis, such as either gender or race. And the problem here is that this fails to address the complexities of any issue. It's like thinking we are only going along a single road, when in fact we're in the much more dynamic place of the intersections. In Crenshaw's words, In other words, in race discrimination cases, discrimination tends to be viewed in terms of sex or class privileged black. In sex discrimination cases, the focus is on race and class privileged women. That is, in discussions of specifically racial disadvantage, the focus is on the disempowering of black men, whilst in discussions of specifically sexual politics, it is white women who are the focus of much discussion. In both cases, the particularities of black women and other women of colour are left out of the normative standpoints. Often they're silenced. For those who are caught in this area of double discrimination, where does it leave them? To return to the analogy of the road intersection, a black woman may be hit on either side, by the force of an impact with sexual discrimination and also by an impact with racial discrimination at the same time. But it is as though the traffic control don't know what to do with a double impact. They can only deal with one impact at a time. In the words of Crenshaw again, this single axis framework erases black women in the conceptualization, identification and remediation of race and sex discrimination. And it does so by limiting inquiry to the experiences of otherwise privileged members of the group. That is, by talking of blackness or women alone, the single axis framework erases black women. Thus Crenshaw goes on to say, because the intersectional experience is greater than the sum of racism and sexism, any analysis that does not take intersectionality into account cannot sufficiently address the particular manner in which black women are subordinated. Crenshaw takes the example of such axes of power at work in the judgments made in US legal cases, in particular in terms of employment disputes such as in the case of Moore v. Hughes helicopters, where the court's refusal to accept that a woman who defined her disadvantage in terms of being a black female could not be held to have the same level of representativeness as someone who defined themselves solely as a female alone. This latter category, generic femaleness, rather than specific black femaleness, of course referred to the context of white females, where the issue of race was not irrelevant, but rather hidden and seemingly ignored. In this particular case, the court decided that the protections applicable to females as a generic could not be applied in the same way to a specifically black female context, even though the women in this context were being doubly discriminated against, as females and as blacks. Crenshaw said, the point is that black women can experience discrimination on any number of ways, and that the contradiction arises from our assumptions that their claims of exclusion must be unidirectional. Here she uses the specifics of a road intersection. Consider an analogy to traffic at an intersection, coming and going in all four directions. Discrimination, like traffic through an intersection, may flow in one direction, and it may flow in another. If an accident happens in an intersection, it can be caused by cars travelling from any number of directions, and sometimes from all of them. Similarly, if a black woman is harmed because she is in the intersection, her injury can result from sex discrimination or race discrimination, or both. Of course, this is not only limited to the erasure of black women. Other single axes of discrimination may also be at play. Thus, other axes may include sexualities, homosexual, heterosexual, bisexual, or gender, both trans and cis genders. It may include class, age, ability, and also religion. As we noted in the case of race and religion, it's often presumed that religion is not an issue in such debates as much as the other issues, since religion is taken to be a matter of choice rather than ascription. 
one may not choose to be disabled, black, homosexual or transsexual. But the implication is that religion, being a matter of what one believes in, is a conscious choice. But, as I've noted already in the earlier episode, for many, religion is as much who they are as any other identities they may have. And this idea of religion as a choice of belief is, as I will be exploring in a later episode, a distinctly historical idea that we take for granted as natural, when in fact it has emerged from the European and North American Protestant religious traditions. More of that later, though. Crenshaw went on to explore her term of intersectionality in a paper she published a few years later in 1991 with the title of Mapping the Margins, Intersectionality, Identity Politics and Violence Towards People of Colour. Using a number of examples of the interplays and intersections between race and gender in American popular culture, she again emphasised the primary issue of the approach. That is, she said... By tracing the categories to their intersections, I hope to suggest a methodology that will ultimately disrupt the tendencies to see race and gender as exclusive and separable. From there she went on to note the applicability of intersections to other categories. The conclusion that she reaches is that these single categories that we rely on for much of our analysis, race, gender, class and so on, do not and cannot exist on their own. There is no race. It exists within its intersections with other differences, such as class, gender, sexualities and so on. Every time we see race, we see it within such intersections, intersecting with other categories, aspects of cultural life. At its most basic, we don't see whiteness and blackness on their own. We see white men, white women, black men, black women and so on intersections of the different categories that we impose onto life. Politically, Crenshaw recommends we see the ways in which intersections build up and produce coalitions, race as a coalition between men and women of colour, and likewise women as a coalition between white, black and other women of colour, and so on. We can only understand each of these in the context of the intersections and the coalitions that they make. She says, recognising the ways in which intersectional experiences of women of colour are marginalised in prevailing conceptions of identity politics does not require that we give up any attempts to organise as communities of colour. Rather, intersectionality provides a basis for reconceptualising race as a coalition between men and women of colour. Intersectionality may provide the means for dealing with other marginalisations as well. For example, race can also be a coalition of straight and gay people of colour, and thus serve as a basis for critique of churches and other cultural institutions that reproduce heterosexism. One example of this in the study of religion is explored in a recent article by Sana Valkonen and Sandra Velenius Corcalo in the journal Culture and Religion. Looking at Protestant religion amongst Sami women, they argued that religion can be understood as a difference constructing certain kinds of gender and gendered religiosity and ethnicity. Such intersectionality addresses the diversity within a religious community. Intersectionality thus opens up a political perspective on religion by turning attention to power structures and mechanisms sustained by these constructed differences in categories. My aim in this episode has been mainly to introduce the term and the approach of intersectionality to our reflections on the study of religion. As we have seen, the category of religion may produce certain kinds of gender and vice versa. The category of gender may in itself produce certain kinds of religion. And both will interplay within the field of power relations in various ways. On top of this, we must look at the issues of race, as well as class, age, sexuality and so on, so that what we see and try to understand is the product of all of these intersections. In the words of the writer Nina Lique, in her introduction to the study of gender and intersectionality, 
Intersectionality can, first of all, be considered as a theoretical and methodological tool to analyse how historically specific kinds of power differentials and or constraining normativities based on discursively, institutionally and or structurally constructed social cultural categorizations such as gender, ethnicity, race, class, sexuality, age, generation, disability, nationality, mother tongue and so on interact and in so doing produce different kinds of societal inequalities and unjust social relations. I'll leave you for now with this challenging definition of intersectionality as a starting point in our attempt to bring all these aspects of culture together within the study of religion. Thanks for listening to this episode today. For more details of the episode, see the Religion Bites section of my website, malloryandi.com forward slash Religion Bites. And there you can also find more details about my other podcast series. And you can also subscribe to this podcast on either iTunes or Stitcher. Do get in touch with me if you have any questions or comments. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next episode. Bye for now.